Hi everyone, it's Sid here from Fundamental Research. Our guest today is Ravi Gill. Ravi is the portfolio manager of Fieldhouse Capital here in Vancouver. We had produced a report on this fund last year. I encourage you to check out this, uh, this report on our platform, researchfrc.com, to have a good understanding of Ravi's strategy and vision for his fund. Um, I can assure you that Ravi has quite a unique perspective and what you will see will be very different from the usual rhetoric we see out there in the media. Before we invite Ravi, here are some key disclaimers. Please take a moment. With that, let's welcome Ravi, taking the time to spend time with us. Uh, um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sid, for having me. Uh, looking forward to uh, the webcast. I've been wanting to have a chat with you and pick your brains on how you see the markets today and where we can find opportunities. So really glad that you took the time today. Uh, Rabi, you'll be able to share your screen, which I think is uh, visible now. For listeners, you can either wait till the end to ask questions, or if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to type them in and we'll try to respond to them. All right, Rabi, so why don't you start with giving us, uh, giving our audience an idea of your background. Um, uh, for sure. So uh, thank you, Sid. Um, so I'm a por discretionary portfolio manager with uh, Fieldhouse Capital here in Vancouver. Uh, and my investment process and strategy uh, really stems around uh, the macro outlook, looking at asset classes and uh, intra-asset class uh, movements uh, and uh, opportunities. Um, so with that, um, you know, I've over 20 years of experience on the investment management and capital market side. So I've worked from venture capital to investment management uh, with teams of managing, you know, uh, multi-billion dollar strategies over the years. Um, about two and a half years ago, I moved on uh, and started my own strategy uh, with Fieldhouse Capital, uh, which is focused on the uh, total return, um, and it's called the Total Return Investor Global Macro Strategy. And uh, the basis of my investment process is really around cycles and trends of the business cycle, and then how you can apply that um, at the asset and uh, sector levels um, throughout the business cycle. Great. For anyone who is not familiar with the uh, total return, do you mind just giving a quick you know, a, a layman's terms explanation? Uh, for sure. Uh, so what we're trying to target is basically, uh, you know, double digit returns, kind of targeting 12 to 15 percent returns on an annualized basis. Um, and regardless of where other equity markets or interest rates are going. So uh, a lot of times what you have in the industry is that you're measured relative to a benchmark. So just an example, if, you know, the TSX uh, equity markets are up 15 uh, percent, uh, you're trying to better uh, the return of the market. But uh, if the markets are down and say, you know, down 10 or 15%, you're trying to lose less than that. Uh, what I'm trying to do with the total return is that regardless of what the market moves are, we're trying to get positive total and absolute returns for you on an ongoing basis. Great. Okay, let's uh, start with uh, your perspective, uh, maybe a snapshot of the economy and the markets uh, as of today. Sure, Sid. Um, so we're in really in unprecedented times, and I think most people uh, can see that uh, on the left-hand chart here. Uh, really, there's a nice recovery that we had both in jobs and sales and GDP uh, in the economy since uh, the housing crisis in 2008, 2009. Uh, and then we had the COVID shock. Uh, and then since the COVID shock, we've had lots of government stimulus, lots of monetary stimulus, record low interest rates, uh, employment uh, coming back, but not really. There's people wanting to work, people making more money by not working, getting government support. And then you also have all these supply chain issues as well, uh, whether it's uh, you know global trade, uh, whether it's local shortages of even simple things like bicycles uh, that uh, have really uh, been impacted uh, both positively and negatively. On the other side is you know hotel leisure and travel is starting to come back, but it's still uh, far away from where it was. And what's interesting is we've seen in the last year and a half or so, the S&P has doubled uh, from its low uh, during the COVID panic. Uh, but what we also know is that all these structural changes in the economy 
end up getting expedited uh, during a crisis. So that basically means that anytime that we have a trend or you know kind of a secular change that's happening, that's long-term government regulation, technology, work from home, uh, it always increases uh, the adoption rate uh, when you have a crisis or you're forced to adapt quickly. Um, so so we're, we're in this uh, unique environment, which um, can be difficult uh, for, for investors. It means more uncertainty, more volatility. Is that what you're looking at? Um, well, yes. Um, and really what happens is, is that we've seen um, uh, on this chart here is that the market returns. Uh, the green here is the, the PMI, which is just the purchasing manager index. And it just shows that uh, as businesses are producing more and growing, uh, the blue number is the year over year change in the S&P 500. So there's a real high correlation that when the economy is doing well, companies are making more money, more income, uh, that translates into higher earnings per share and usually that translates into higher equity markets. So if you understand where you're in the business cycle, it gives you uh, a lot of uh, advantages over just kind of uh, fundamental or technical analysis. And as you can see quickly here, Sid, that you have these cycles that go kind of from, you know, uh, mid 2003 to 2008, uh, 2008, there's a shorter one into 2012, then another one bottom 2015, and then we had the COVID bottom, but you have these continuous cycles and they can kind of expand and contract, uh, but they do have a lot of uh, common characteristics around them. Got it. So is, uh, is it fair to say that PE multiple is one of your key uh, tools or uh, indicators uh, or are there other tools that you help that help uh, you so, in your forecast? Uh, so it's one piece of the puzzle. Uh, really what it comes down to is when you're forecasting, especially around cycles, is that humankind has uh, a tendency to have linearly thinking. And that is what just happened recently. You extrapolate that into the forward. Uh, but what happens is at the type of, top of these cycles is really when the risk ends up being the highest and you should be taking you know, chips off the table. And at the bottom, um, when it's the scariest is actually the least riskiest time. So we're trying to look for uh, a process to, to help manage uh, those inflection points and kind of stay on the right side of the economic trends. Okay, where do you see, or you know, what do you see as drivers of markets, uh, you know, both in terms of return and risk these days? Yeah, so there's lots of uh, information out there and uh, statistics, uh, economic readings. Sid, what really comes down to is the cost of money and the cost of goods. And then the main thing really is, and the cost of money is interest rates uh, and the change in interest rates. So it's not the absolute level, whether they're 3%, 5% or 1%, but it's how much have they changed over the last year and a half or two years. And then also the cost of goods, how much is, you know, price of oil increased, how much are wages impacting, you know, both the profit margin and uh, the cost to consumers. Uh, and if you can take a look at those, um, and really interest rates today are going to impact where the economy is going to be 18 months from now, where the economy is today is a function of where interest rates were 18 months ago. So there's this lead lag uh, component uh, that impacts uh, the markets. And I'll get into a little bit more detail of that. So, um... How do you assess, um, you know, where we are in a business cycle? You showed the PE charts before. Mm -hmm. um, how can a layman or, you know, a reasonably educated person look at that and kind of find out where we are? Uh, yeah. Uh, so what we can do, Sid, is we can really look at where capital is flowing throughout the business cycle. Usually at, uh, as you can see on the slide here, at the bottom, of the cycle and we can see here, especially in Vancouver and the US as well, housing is usually the first one to recover. So if you start to understand and see capital flowing into housing and uh, positive returns there, uh, then you get into the really the highest risk, uh, the most cyclical type of um, sectors and industries do well right at the bottom of the uh, business cycle. And then what happens as, as the business cycle matures, you kind of rotate into value and growth type of equities or opportunities where um, the economic environment is less uh, important or the amount of stimulus uh, in the system from you know, low interest rates and lower inflation um, is less dependent on those companies. And then what happens is at the end of the 
business cycle, you really want to be in bonds, government treasuries, uh, or utilities, um, and really defensive staples where you can protect your, your capital, because what's happening is just the essentials are being bought, and everything else um, has slowed down quite a bit. I should say that this is a very well laid out chart. It's uh, useful for any investor. Everyone should frame and keep this. So <laughs> where, where, are we, where are we exactly in this uh, cycle? So yeah, so so what sometimes happens is that instead of it just having a single cycle, sometimes there's a bump that happens in the middle where you have kind of a mid-cycle transition and, and it's kind of, uh, uh, it extends uh, for a little bit. So it seems like right now we're, you know, close to this uh, kind of one third to halfway through on the business cycle. And the reason I say that is if you go to the next slide, if you look at PMIs versus new orders, new orders is kind of tells you where the, the business cycle is going to be going. Uh, this is a longer term chart, but if you just look on the right hand side, you can kind of see it with the green PMIs seem to have topped for the, the in the short term. Uh, and underneath it is the blue where you can see that new orders are kind of dipped lower and then they're gonna pop up higher and they actually don't peak till probably early uh, 2020. So this is this kind of a mid cycle transition that you're happening where everyone has a pent up demand. It's being uh, met uh, by businesses, small sh slowdown here. And usually what happens is you just have a uh, kind of a adjustment or a correction as I see in the stock market. Um, that yeah, I guess, kind I guess of you see, so you saw, we saw the same spike um, back in the, past uh, last recession, 20, 2008, 2009-ish. Yes, so, and you see it on a regular basis, but sometimes it's just kind of expand or it happens a few months earlier. So it, it's not a perfect correlation, but it's definitely something to watch um, and gives you good insight. So what you can also look at is on this chart here, I have the two-year and the 10-year uh, US government bonds. Uh, but what I've done is I've inverted them and it's the two year change and I've moved it forward about 18 months. So as you can see on the left hand side, short term interest rates really correlate quite closely to what's happening with the business cycle as you know, rates uh, had fallen, uh, you actually have the business cycle falling and as they start to increase again, uh, you have a pickup in uh, the, the business cycle. And on the right hand side is the, the longer term rates. And you can start to see the same um, uh, same pattern there as well. Uh, again, um, it, it's always within one or two kind of quarters, but it gives you the general uh, direction and position where you're in, in the business cycle. So even though that uh, this might churn over, you have to remember we're still in positive territory above 50, it still means you're growing. But if it's rolling over here, it just means you're growing at a, at a slower pace. From this, can you predict or estimate when we can see rate increases, hikes? Uh, yeah, so what's happening right now is the Fed uh, is going to be accommodative and keep short term interest rates uh, low for a long time. But if you look at the other end of the yield curve at the 30 year, uh, here's a chart from the Bank of America that shows that the yield on the 30 year uh, bottomed out uh, almost at the time of COVID uh, is increased all the way into the summertime. Um, at about 2.35% and since has dropped about 35, 40 basis points. And this is also correlates to what's happening with the kind of reopening versus uh, closure uh, of the economy uh, sectors. Uh, so with that as well, uh, another way to look at here is this shows, this chart here shows the year over year change in the S&P 500 and also the ISM. It's just another survey for, for the PMIs. As you can see on the right hand side, it appears that the, both the returns um, and uh, the PMIs are peaking, but they're still in positive territory. Uh, so, now, now I'm just going to go one step further there, Sid, um, is that this is a chart, and sorry, it's a little bit dark here, um, of the 30-year uh, U.S. Uh, bond. As you can see, over the past 30 years, interest rates uh, have fallen and continue to be in this trend line uh, going lower. Uh, if you do the opposite and you look at bond prices, so when interest rates fall, bond prices actually increase. Uh, this is... Uh, just a chart of uh, the U.S. 30-year bond price. As you can see, it went from, you know, uh, the low 60s uh, back in the late 80s, and now we're trading at uh, over $164. Uh, but within it, there's these 
periods where interest rates move anywhere from you know one to two to two and a half percent uh, and they repeat in these kind of uh, regular cycles as they go up down kind of consolidate go up down and if you uh, zoom in a little bit here as with this chart you can see back in 2011 um, from the bottom when interest rates uh, fell or bond prices went up you have moves of you know 24 percent here in 2014 yet another opportunity where it's 20 plus percent uh, if you look at the flip side when interest rates back up you know uh, bond prices fell about 18 percent um, and then back in 2018 you had another 27 percent move uh, recently we had a correction where interest rates backed up, as I said, to 2.35%. Uh, and as long bonds fell by about 30 basis points, you actually got about a 6% return on long bonds. So there's a real opportunity um, for you to position in long bonds as the business cycle matures and rolls over. And what we found from our research is if you go back uh, you know, uh, 50 to 60 years, uh, each time the business cycle kind of peaks and starts to roll over, you have interest rates that fall on the long end, anywhere from one to 2%. Um, and just from a technical perspective, uh, the percentage change in a 30 year bond for a 1% change in interest rates is about 16. So a 1% move in long interest rates can, you can obtain a 16% move uh, or, or profit or increase in price in that underlying bond. What's the typical time frame from, you know, in a, you know, during a recession after that rates start to pick up, when does it, how long does it take for rates to maximize or, or peak? Uh, historically? It, it really depends on uh, how much kind of monetary stimulus uh, is in um, the, the, the pipeline. So what tends to happen is that, um, and it's uh, kind of counter to what more, most people think, is that when the economy is doing uh, well, interest rates actually rise because the risk goes down and uh, capital flows to other assets. Um, and what happens is when the economy rolls over, interest rates fall down. Now, the upside of the business cycle can be anywhere from kind of one to kind of three and a half to four years. Uh, so that's usually where you see that drift of interest rates higher. But on the move down, uh, when things slow down and you get closer to a recession, um, that move usually happens within kind of 12 to 18 months, which is a bit quicker. So about a third of the time it takes for interest rates to back up. Got it. So slightly shifting gears, um, any ETFs that can be used? Yes, yeah, so I really focus on futures in my fund and my strategy. It just provides more uh, liquidity and uh, ease of positioning. But for retail investors that don't have access to that, uh, you know, the TLT and the TBT. So the TLT is just uh, uh, an ETF of uh, long dated US treasuries, 20 years plus. And the TBT is just the inverse of that. Um, so when you think that interest rates are actually going to increase, uh, it gives you that uh, option to, to have that short or that inverse uh, exposure to that. Just to make it uh, slightly simpler for the audience, so TLT uh, it gets to you exposure to interest rates. Uh, uh, does it move up with the bond prices or does it move up, moves up with yield? Uh, so the TLT, uh, as interest rates fall, bond prices move up. So that's the, uh, the security you would want to buy that when interest rates are moving down. When interest rates are moving up, the TBT, uh, is the inverse uh, and actually uh, so with rates expected to move up next year so you're looking at uh, more in opportunities in the tbt space versus clt these days is that correct uh, in, in in the long end uh, i'm actually expecting interest rates to actually come down mm -hmm. uh, but in the short end they go up so the two year and the overnight uh, where the federal reserve uh, kind of controls that has more impact uh, I expect those interest rates to start to move up, but you have a pivot uh, where longer term stays kind of range bound here at, or moves lower. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the opportunity I think is greater at this time in the TLT versus uh, the TBT. Very good. So with all this uh, that on all that said, where do you see the excellent, you know, the best opportunities these days? Now, do you have a longer term, long term? Um, kind of recommendation or opportunities you're looking at in the short term? 
Um, so right now, what I'm seeing is that economic tailwinds that we have are going to be moderating into kind of uh, the first quarter, first half of 2022. Uh, having said that, I think we're this fall, we're going to have a period of, of volatility, which gives you an opportunity to add exposure to risk assets. Uh, but I think going into the fall as well to build positions in longer term government bonds is a good starting point. Um, and you can, you know, generate double digit returns over the medium term on that. Uh, just to add to that, uh, you know, I think active management in the markets that we're in uh, is very crucial. Um, that's not to say to day trade your whole portfolio, but, you know, parts of your portfolio as different assets, uh, bonds become expensive or cheap. Uh, it never hurts to take some profits and then uh, wait for, for that cycle to turn and reenter. Excellent. For an average investor, what do you consider to be an ideal mix uh, in terms of portfolio mix, be it equities, debt, cash, uh, equities, bonds, cash? Uh, what would you, What is your suggestion or recommendation? Um, so, Sid, there's no cookie cutter uh, formula to that. It really depends on uh, you know the client, your risk profile, your net worth, um, and what you're using your uh, investments for. Is it just for longer term growth, or um, are you trading and and uh, it's an active part of your your income? Uh, but uh, regardless to say, yeah, I think you should definitely be tilted towards equities uh, over fixed income that's credit or high yield given how low interest rates are um, and then also you know be focused and tilted a bit more towards uh, technology or companies that can offer that uh, recurring revenue software as a service type of business models because uh, that gives you the most uh, defensiveness um, throughout the business cycle. Fantastic uh, any closing thoughts Arabi? Uh, yeah, just, you know, there's lots of information out there for investors. Uh, sometimes it's overwhelming, almost like a fire hose of information coming to you. Uh, I think the key thing is just to be uh, disciplined uh, and try to figure out a process that works for you. And it does take time. Um, so, you know, don't be frustrated. And it's always key to, to manage your risk because um, you want to be able to stay in the game and invest over the longer term um, and, and have that ability, even if you do hit a few speed bumps here and there. Okay, Rabi, uh, if, uh, any if any uh, any of the any listeners here, if they want to reach out to you, what's the best way to get in touch? Yeah, they can reach me uh, by email at rabi.gill at fieldhousecap.com, um, or you can go to the Fieldhouse uh, Capital uh, website, um, and there's my contact information there. Okay, and as I mentioned earlier, we did produce a report uh, on Rabi's fund last year. So anyone interested? You can check that out from our platform, researchfrc.com. So thank you, uh, Rabbi, so much for taking time today and you know, sharing with us uh, what you're looking at these days, where we see, where we can find opportunities. And also thank you, everyone on the call, uh, for taking time. A recording will be uploaded on our YouTube channel shortly. Please ensure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and also sign up to be a member of our platform, researchfrc.com. You'll get alerts when we publish new reports. And of course, you'll be able to see a list of top, top picks. Thanks again and wish you all the best and stay safe. Great. Thank you, Sid.